our uh, winter school. It's for me a pleasure and really an honor that uh, you have been uh, uh, so competent and so able in order to write. Moreover, I have been, I have seen that some of you have improved their curriculum in this year, and uh, it makes me happy as well because it's always positive. Uh, uh, I had seen that some, some of you were very good students, so I'm not surprised to tell the truth, but uh, it's, it's, it's really a big pleasure. OK, I won't lose any more time in words because uh, at 5 o'clock p.m. we have another event in this same room, so we have to be quite strict about timing. So each of you will have only, unfortunately, 10 minutes for, <coughs> for um, its uh, uh, speech. Uh, and uh, so I will give the word to, to the first. And I think that the first person is Anna Milioni, uh, which is now uh, uh, a PhD student at the Department of Philosophy in the King's College of London. So my my felicitation, Anna. I am very glad for for your result. I, I think it has not been easy to be admitted as a PhD uh, student in such an important institution. So, the word to you and uh, tell tell us something about uh, the social security in the European Union a normative approach. Thank you very much. And also for the invitation to this presentation of their book. When I attended the Solidarity in EU Law Winter School uh, in Pisa last year, I couldn't have imagined how much more present questions of solidarity would be in our lives in the months that followed. And thus I am very happy for the opportunity to return uh, to my paper a year later. In my yes, paper. I must admit that we chose the we chose the right the right topic for the winter school. I can't yes, deny it. it was <laughs> very topical. Um, so, in my paper, I attempt to provide a normative approach to European solidarity. The kind of solidarity that I focus on is intra-European, within and among member states of the European Union. But this does not include other kinds of solidarity. Miana, My paper... uh, please, please switch off your microphones, the people not speaking. Otherwise, there is a noise and we can't hear Anna properly. Please. Okay, forse colpa mia. Leonardo, poi magari. Ok, va bene. Go on, go on, Anna. Excuse me. Ok, thank you. Can you hear me better now? Much better. Thank you. Um, so my paper begins by analyzing the tension which exists in the current legislation of the European Union in relation to solidarity. I then argue that this tension creates a lack of legitimacy in the Union's policies and should be addressed through a revision of the current uh, legislation. Following that, I make the claim that this legislative revision should be toward the direction of protecting social solidarity both at the national and the transnational level. Let me first present the tension that exists in the EU legislation regarding uh, social solidarity. On the one hand, social solidarity is inextricably linked with the European tradition, and the promotion of solidarity has been among the main guiding principles of the European Union. From the first treaties that led to the creation of the European Coal and Steam Community, to the treaties of Maastricht and Lisbon, solidarity appears as a fundamental principle in the European Union. It also holds a prominent place in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. On the other hand, other fundamental principles of the European Union appear to clash with the protection of social solidarity, the freedom of movement within the EU, the freedom of services and the principle of non-discrimination, have led to important restrictions of, on the ability of the member states to shape their national welfare policies and have put national welfare systems under pressure. This tension is evident in the case law of the Court of Justice uh, of the European Union. Indicatively, I mentioned the Bray case, the Dano case and the Almanovic case. There, and in many other cases, the Court of Justice of the European Union 
So to, to balance the freedom of movement and the principle of non-discrimination among EU citizens on the one side, with the viability of the national social security systems. This case law indicates a practical compromise according to which restrictions to the principle of non-discrimination can, can be made to prevent migrant EU citizens from becoming an unreasonable burden on the national welfare system of the member states. Moreover, the Court of Justice of the European Union has ruled that EU law does not allow EU citizens to exercise their freedom of movement on the sole purpose of welfare benefits provided in another member state. However, despite this practical compromise, the tension remains, and it is a tension between national and European solidarity, since the demands of equal treatment of all EU citizens endangers the viability of the national welfare systems. This has grave effects. On the one side, it undermines national welfare systems, which appear to be clingy and outdated, in constant need of further support and unable to achieve their goal. On the other side, it undermines the legitimacy of the European Union, which appears to go against its commitment to protect social solidarity and against the political will of the European citizens, as expressed in the treaties. So, a revision of the European legislation is needed in order to resolve this tension. In what follows, I argue that in this revision, the EU has an obligation to act in a way that respects and promotes the national welfare systems of the member states, as well as social solidarity among member states. The reason for this lies in the normative source of uh, solidarity. In the literature, argument, uh, arguments in favour of solidarity often appear on the basis of either the economic contribution of the EU migrants in their host states, or of the shared identity of EU citizens. However, both of these grounds are problematic. Appealing to the economic contribution does not ground the distinctively European solidarity, since third country migrants may also contribute to the economies of their host states. It is also limited to national social solidarity and does not justify transnational solidarity among member states. On the other side, the notion of a shared European identity is much contested, and additionally, even if we accept that a shared European identity does exist, it is not clear why it should lead to obligations of social solidarity. Thus, instead of appealing uh, to these grounds, in my paper I follow the proposal of Andrea San Giovanni and argue that an obligation of social solidarity can be grounded on a demand of reciprocity. The European project is a project that is created through the joint action of the member states. These states join together in the European Union in order to promote their citizens in need of This joint action entails that the member states are under the obligation to share the benefits and the burdens of their cooperation in a fair way. Both the freedom of movement and the principle of non-discrimination are important features of the European Union, which allow it to fulfill its aims and bring considerable benefits that would not be possible without the joint action of the member states. The equal access of all EU citizens in national welfare systems is also crucial in that regard. However, as we saw, this puts national welfare systems under big pressure, and this cost is directly related to the implementation of the European Union's policies. The European Union, then, has an obligation to recompensate member states for this cost, for example, through a European Solidarity Fund, which could be distributed to the member states according to the extent that their national uh, social uh, solidarity systems have been overburdened due to their participation in the EU project. This solution respects the exclusive uh, national competence of the member states of national welfare, but ensures that the burdens that EU membership implies to the national welfare systems 
are equally shared by all the member states of the European Union. Moreover, this obligation is granted on the idea that the member states... And now you have two minutes. Yes, thank you. I'm reaching to the end. Um, so this obligation is grounded on the idea that the member states have benefit from being part of the European Union. And that transnational solidarity, they are returning some of the benefits that they have gained in order to restitute any unfair burdening imposed on national welfare systems for the creation of these benefits. Justified in this way, this obligation of transnational solidarity is difficult to be refuted by the member states. To sum up, I demonstrated um, the tension that exists in the EU legislation in relation to social solidarity, a tension that should be resolved through legislative revision. I then argued that in this revision, there are normative grounds in support of protecting and promoting social solidarity at the national and transnational uh, level, based on the nature of the EU as a scheme of cooperation among member states who should share both its benefits and its burdens. Thank you all very much for my presentation. I'm sorry, Professor, your microphone is is mute. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for your presentation. Uh, I appreciated it a lot. And personally, I share completely your idea of a new solidarity. It could really be the, the, the right solution. Of course, as usual, it's not easy to convince the state to take a step forward in the European integration, and this would be a step forward, actually. OK, so uh, I have to say, uh, I have to excuse me with uh, uh, Professor Matteo Del Chica because <laughs> he had to introduce the session. I will give him the word at the end, just before uh, Marcel, just before Professor Marcelo La Banca. So uh, the next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Andrea Augusto uh, Giuliato Ferrasso. Uh, he is a PhD student at the Faculty of Law at the University of Brasilia, and the title of his speech shall be the legal meaning of a disaster under the European Union legal system. Please, Andre, you can start. You have 10 minutes. Please respect the timing. Okay, thank you, Professor Pasquale. I would like to thank you, Professor Pasquale, and the Jean Monet Module Soil Law Stock for the invitation to collaborate with this book and for all the support to at the University of Pisa and my contribution to this book is about the legal meaning of a disaster under the European Union legal system <clears throat> and this chapter has great inspiration in the classes of Professor Teresa Russo during the winter course. In this chapter I propose that it is important to understand the legal concept of a disaster from the contributions of the disaster law. So some considerations on the concepts of natural disasters and man-made disaster were presented to contribute to the formation of a legal sense of the disasters. These considerations help us to provide a legal definition of the concept of disasters and also distinguishing the concepts of crisis and disasters for the application of the solidarity clause. The Article 222 of the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union has come to characterize an emergent system of solidarity to safeguard member states affected, affected by disasters. Although the article has provided a more solidarity, it is, its application requires a better understanding of the characterization of disaster to avoid the misuse of the solidarity clause. The application of the clause faces a terminological issue since the concepts of crisis and disaster are not clarified by the treaty and by the council decisions. There is the possibility of applying the clause 
in face of three events, natural disasters, man-made disasters, and terrorist attacks. As for the definition of terrorist attack, this concept does not present a great obstacle for the application of the clause. Nevertheless, the application in cases of disasters is more imprecise and has a broad concept within the treaty. The decision 415 of 2014 of the EU presents some initial contribut contributions in this sense, but the definition given by the decision does not clarify any parameter related to a disaster for the application of the clause. Under the terms of this decision, any impact situation, whether caused by man or natural, would give rise to the application of the clause. For the disaster law, the legal sense of disaster is related to the perception of two other elements addressed in this chapter, risk and crisis, which are not confused with uh, disaster. It's very important to address that despite the scientific on the causes of crisis, climate change seems to play a prominent role in this scenario. For this reason, it's possible to state that the occurrence of disaster in general present competing human and natural causes, which makes impossible to distinguish between human and natural disasters. In this regard, this chapter proposed that the concept of disaster should be unified, since the factors that motivate the obligation of mutual assistance is the consequences and not its causes. The legal meaning of a disaster, therefore, presents relevance to law when its configuration is expressed by consequential terms. Disasters are conceptualized from a triangulation of factors, hence the understanding of the legal sense of disaster is related to the analysis of its causes, consequences, and the stability of the affected system. Regarding the consequences, the definition acquires a legal utility that is aligned with epistemological anthropocentrism since disaster are related to loss of human life and property. This concept contributes to the operationalization of the concept of a disaster because it's easily measurable in a negative event. This understanding of disasters is even applied in the United Nations International Law Commission on the protection of persons from disasters when they mentioned that disasters are events that result in human suffering, environmental damage, and that seriously disrupt the functioning of society. This concept, based on the consequences and the analysis of stability of systems, is more appropriate when evoking the solidarity clause in comparison to the one solely based on the causes. Considering the legal concept of disasters, it's important to analyze the dis distinction between crisis and disasters, bearing in mind the Council Decision 415 of 2014 of the European Union. Through this decision, it's remain, it remains clear that a crisis can result from a disaster which in turn can lead to a political and economical and economic crisis in a state requiring coordinated assistance from the European Union. An important yeah, five case, minutes, Augusto, eh? five minutes. Okay, thank you. An important case that exemplifies the conceptual confusion between crisis and disasters for the application of the Article 222 is the Greek case Anagnostakis versus Commission due to the financial crisis affecting Greece. In this aspect, it is important to point out that crisis and disasters are distinct situations. While a disaster refers to a situation with a major impact, the definition of crisis relates to a post-factual context. When thinking of an economic crisis, as the case of Greece, it is important to think what would be the disaster that turmoil of the financial system and that could justify the application of the Article 222? Financial risk in these cases presents itself 
within an economic logic of predictability. These elements, the predictability, is not verified in the occurrence of disasters worth the solidarity protection stipulated by the article. In this context of economic crisis, it's not possible to verify inevitability, uncertainty, and vulnerability related to a disaster, and therefore is not to be confused with it. Here that the solidarity the op operational resources of member states, but also to directly providing financial resources. However, it should be applied to help EU countries in disaster recovery based on the analysis of causes, consequences, and stability. In conclusion, the uh, characterization of a disaster is not to be is not confused with the idea of although crisis established because of a disaster, disasters worth the protection established by the Article 222 are related to negative events with risk and unpredictability. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Augusto. Uh, uh, you did in a very short time uh, uh, my compliments because you respected perfectly the 10 minutes uh, and you gave us a very good uh, legal analysis or legal definition of the word disasters as, uh, as, uh, as lawyers do actually. Uh, so le let's go to the next person because uh, I want to respect uh, timing. The next person is Alessio Scafidi, who is also a PhD student, but here in Italy at the Department of Law of the University of Napoli Partenope. And um, the title uh, of um, his um, uh, speech is a very uh, up-to-date one because it's the European stability mechanism and denied solidarity. Uh, and the topic is a topic that you are discussing at the Italian parliament, uh, right, uh, in these days. So for us, it's really impossible to be more up to date than Alessio. So uh, I give you the word, please. Thank please you. respect the minutes. Of course. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alessio Scaffidi. I am a PhD student of law faculty of Università di Napoli Partenope. I am very glad to be here with you today. And uh, before starting, of course, I would like to thank Professor Pasquali, Professor Del Chicca for this opportunity, but as well my colleagues uh, Miriam and Gabriele for their incredible helps during these months. Well, today I would like to, to share with you my point of view about uh, solidarity in EU law, and uh, I will do it uh, analyzing uh, uh, what uh, has been described as the main mechanism designed to promote solidarity and cooperation uh, between member states, that is uh, the European stability mechanism. To do this, uh, I would like to share with you a few slides that I have prepared, and uh, I hope you can see it okay can you see it yes or no yes yes okay, yes, yes. Perfect. okay well. thanks uh, first of all uh, in my opinion we have to specify what esm is esm is the euro area firewall his mission is to provide financial assistance to euro area countries experiencing or threatened by severe financing problems Despite his mission, and this is, the, this is very important to underline in my opinion, ESM was established through an international agreement signed in 2012. Nevertheless, it is strictly linked to the legal framework of the EU, and in particular with the amended Article 135 TF EU. As we can see in this slide, the ESM can count on several instruments, we will focus later on the precautionary credit line, the one that, in my opinion, is the most important, for which uh, have, have never been used. In particular, uh, instrument, the first instrument, the fifth, uh, the fifth instrument, instrument has been used. Um, the ESM, in a spirit of solidarity, we can say, um, has disbursed during its life a total of 295 billion to five program countries. As you can see, Cyprus, uh, Ireland, 
market financing and economic growth. So, so far, um, everything looks perfect, but uh, unfortunately, as uh, in life, in real life, uh, reality is quite uh, different. And uh, as confirmed by the European Court of Justice, uh, to be compatible with the no bailout clause present in Article 125 TFU, uh, the granting of any required financial assistance under the European Stability subject to strict conditionality. These policy conditions are listed in a memorandum of understanding, which is signed by the beneficiary country, of course, and the European Commission, and approved by the ESM Board of Governors, one of the three governing bodies of the ESM. Here we have, for example, uh, the case of Cyprus. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you all the measures adopted by Cyprus, uh, but you can check uh, on the you can check them easily on the official website of ESM because if you go on uh, for example on fiscal measure on sector and you click you can see all the measure adopted in this sector by Cyprus anyway for our discussion it's just important to see that usually we have these six macro area of condition it means uh, fiscal measures fiscal structural measure financial sector policies other market policies. Uh, and uh, in this case, for example, we can see that uh, Cyprus adopted uh, in the fiscal structure, structural sector uh, almost you know, uh, 247 measures. But what does it mean uh, concretely? Well, concretely, uh, we can say that in the name of macroeconomic uh, adjustments, ESM has already prescribed the cutbacks in uh, welfare expenditures, namely pension funds, social insurance schemes, health care and education, with terrifying consequences on the social and economic rights uh, of the EU citizen. A situation, in my opinion, far, far away from the original spirit of solidarity. And nowadays, as uh, Professor, Professor uh, Pasquale mentioned before, there is the risk uh, that uh, this situation can become even worse cause of the ongoing uh, ESM treaty reform. Tomorrow, uh, there will be a very important uh, Euro summit on this subject, and we will see what uh, will happen. Here we have a sort of a timeline of the reform, and we can say that in this moment, the reform is in a very advanced state. Why I think there is a risk? Well, at least uh, for two reasons. Firstly, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the precautionary credit line, the one uh, the instrument creates uh, that we can uh, see more specifically here, uh, is, um, uh, ha has been created with the goal of maintaining continuous access to market financing. It's composed by two credit lines, the precautionary condition credit line and the enhanced condition credit line. Well, the treaty reform provides for stricter eligibility criteria to have access to the precautionary condition credit line. As we can see here, for example, uh, we have uh, as, uh, for the, as a, an eligible uh, eligibility criteria, we have a general government deficit not exceeding 3% of G GDP or a general government structural budget balance at or above the country specific minimum benchmark. Well, it means, that, it means that uh, it's harder for states to have access to this kind of assistance. Secondly, and uh, in my opinion, this is the, the biggest problem. More in general, the revised text of the treaty states many times, many times that the ESM should provide stability support only to ESM members whose debt is considered sustainable and whose repayment capacity to the ESM is confirmed. If we add this, in, uh, if we add, the, if uh, we add to this the introduction of the single limb uh, collection collective action clause, it means the private sector involvement that are introduced by the reform in the treaty. We can easily understand that uh, sovereign debt restructuring will be required uh, as a condition to access ESM assistance for states without a sustainable. For example, Italy. 
And if we have a look to the Greek experience, we can have an idea of what it means. Well, in conclusion, mm, I perfectly agree with the idea of many scholars and as well uh, the idea of the European Court of Justice that solidarity exists only with the associated conditionality. Nevertheless, I think that uh, this conditionality and the one of the future ESM can transform solidarity in another victim of the EU financial crisis. For this reason, in the short term, I would suggest to clarify the role of the private sector involvement, adopting a previous version of Article 12 of the treaty, that uh, the text of the article you can read in this slide. Uh, this version uh, never entered into force. And um, th this version limits to exceptional circumstances this kind of involvement. Unfortunately, I have to admit that this solution at the moment is almost impossible due to the advanced state of the reform that I have already mentioned. In the long term, I will, uh, in the long term, I think it's necessary to integrate the ESM into the, into the uh, EU legal framework, as already proposed in the past, because the lack of uh, a democratic institution from the decision-making process hampered the legitimacy, the legitimacy of the mechanism as well as the effect of solidarity. Or taking uh, also the experience of federal states, uh, I would uh, suggest to replace the ESM with an automatic fiscal stabilizer, something that, as you can imagine, uh, supports the creation of a European fiscal union. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alessio. Uh, I found a presentation uh, please, if you can, after uh, give your slide to uh, Gabriele and Miriam, uh, I would really appreciate it. It for would sure, be useful, sure. uh, uh, no doubt. And uh, well, personally, I think that the concept of solidarity based on associate conditionality is a poor concept of solidarity. It's not true complete solidarity. That's my point of view, which is not very important compared to the uh, European Court of Justice, uh, EU, EU Court of Justice uh, point of view. But I mean, it's it's not the the solidarity that we have inside the member states. Yeah. It's, 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 it's something else. But that, that's my opinion, of course. So uh, Let's go to the next uh, uh, speaker, who is Geraldo Geraleite, who is a legislative consultant of the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil, and he will uh, uh, speak about social inequality, social rights, and the principle of solidarity in Brazil. So let's let's us co start comparing uh, what happens in the EU in the European Union, which unfortunately is just an international organization and not a federal state with what happens in a real federal state as Brazil is. So the world, uh, I leave you the word to please respect me. Professor, dear professor and colleagues, it's a joy to present the paper Social Inequality, Social Rights and the Principle of Solidarity in Brazil. I apologize for my difficult English. I will do the best I can in this presentation. Firstly, I will examine some data on social inequality in Brazil. Then I will deal with racial codes for admission to public service and public educational institutions. Finally, I will look at some of the Supreme Court's decisions on affirmative action, especially uh, racial codes. Well, there is a widespread myth around the world that Brazil is a mixed race democracy. On one hand, a superficial look at street parties and beaches will only show people friendly sharing the same space in despite of such diverse social classes or races. On the other hand, however, a deeper look will show a country that cannot be reconciled. There is indeed a social gap perpetuated by racism. Let's see. 
According to official data in 2018, black people represented 55.80% of the population, but represented only 27% of Brazilians with their highest income. Among Brazilians with the lowest income, black people totaled 75%. Also, in 2018, black people represented 76% of homicide victims. And in the National Congress, only 18% of those elected declared themselves black or pardo. Given this situation, we must ask ourselves, what is the explanation for so many adversities? Brazil's profound social inequalities are associated to a large extent with the exploitation of slave labor for more than 350 years. Brazil was the largest slave territory in the mercantilist world. No other American country used slave labor as much, and no other country delayed the abolition of forced labor for so long. And when Brazilian, Brazil finally decided to face the problem, it chose a white abolition carried out by the ruling classes under their conditions. There was how Brazil passed an abolition law and then abandoned the entire Afro-descendant population to his own fate. The result is reflected in no social statistics nowadays. In this turn, the current Brazilian constitution must be understood as a response both to the social and political demands of redemocratization and to the deep economic, social and regional inequalities. Thus, the Constitution was not limited to restoring the full functioning of a representative institution. In an unprecedented way, it incorporated the principle of solidarity and took the construction of a just and solidarity-based society as one of the fundamental principles. Under this Constitution, several social programs and inclusive public policies were implemented, promote income for the poorest population, access to home ownership, health and education. Besides that, in order to face the exclusion of a specific groups, affirmative action become the main policies adopted in Brazil. Among other measures from our legal system, there is the possibility of special treatment for the admission uh, of black, black people to public schools and to public service. Before racial quotas, public universities were mostly attended by white students. In 2001, only 5% uh, of black and students attended the public college and university. In 2018, the enrollment of black and pardo students exceeded the number of uh, white people, representing 50.3% uh, of the total number in the highest level in public education. Black people are still underrepresented, especially concerning the most disputed courses. However, we must recognize the uh, Maybe Geraldo has some problem with his connection. What do you think? I think so. Mm. Okay. Let's wait a couple of minutes and uh, if he's not able to solve them, uh, we will continue with the next speaker and then when Geraldo is ready, he can restart uh, or rather finish his speech. Bom, 
I lost the sign. Uh, okay. I can continue. Sure, great, great, great. You solved very quickly. No problem, Gerard. You have only five minutes, though. Okay. Uh, black people are uh, are still underrepresented, especially concerning the most disputed courses. However, we must recognize that significant steps have been taken. In public service, black and poor people already take up about 47% positions. However, their presence is reduced in the most respected jobs among of diplomats, federal attorneys, judge, and public of black and part does not uh, exceed the 15 percent. Therefore, racial codes are still necessary policies not only to fight social exclusion to specific groups, but also to make the Brazilian state itself more plural and representative. Despite the pro positive result, compensatory measures, especially, especially racial codes, have a lot of objections. Critics claim that one cannot be held responsible for the mistakes made by others in the past. They also take the principle of equality to assert that but negative discrimination and legislative prote protection would be unconstitutional. For the Supreme Court, however, those claims are individualistic and do not consider the very norms contained in the Constitution, whose objective is to build a free, just, and solidarity-based society. Hence, the current generation must be held accountable for repairing past damage to avoid eternalizing the problem. Concerning the law of resolve vacancies in public service, STF understood it necessary to overcome structural and institutional racism and guarantee material equality among citizens. In other decision concerning the law to reserve a percentage of vacancies in educational institutions, STF decided that the Constitution Constitution authorized general public policies and those aimed to act uh, at uh, specific groups. Therefore, measures that seek to change the historical picture of inequality that characterize rac racial and social relations must be analyzed in the light of the principle in the state itself. The very Constitution, by establishing the principle of solidarity and uh, inequality, aims to protect minutes, those who have been uh, historically excluded, sacrificed, or persecuted. Hence, compensatory measures are not against the equality established in the Constitution. On the contrary, they honor it. They honor it giving effectiveness to several principles, including the principle of solidarity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Geraldo. I found your speech very, very interesting because you reminded us that after all, every rose has its thorn, because I, I, I started presenting you saying that maybe in Brazil things might be better, because it is a federation, a real federation, while the European Union is just an organization, an international organization, although a peculiar one, but you explained us that there are problems as well, and one of the most important problem is racism and the underrepresentation of black people in your federalist system. Uh, thank you very much uh, also for respecting the 10 minutes. So um, the next speaker is Tania Maria Borges da, Sos da Costa. She is also a PhD student at Victoria Law School in Brazil, and her speech will be about Jewish solidarity an ancien reg law regime as forerunner of contemporary fundamental human rights. So uh, I leave you the floor 
to um, to you. Uh, you have, uh, as everybody else, Tanya, you have 10 minutes, so please try to respect the timing. Good morning. <laughs> I, I think that Tanya is going to show us some slides. Hola, uh, good morning. I am Tanya Maria, Brazil. Um, uh, my trabajo uh, uh, is about sing is about uh, the Jewish solidarity, an ancient law regime as forerunner of contemporary fundamental human rights. Uh, okay, I can start reading. Objective, reflect on Hebrew solidarity as the statute of the ancients, a precursor to contemporary fundamental right, human rights. Methodology, empirical, qualitative with the use of dialectic for the development of the article. Okay, results, the origin of solidarity practices in the pre-modern conception is identified in the period that goes from the ancient world until the end of the Middle Ages to combat social inequality. Number two, the society that stood out the most was the Hebrew community with origins in the sacred commandments revealed by God of the Hebrews, I am Yahweh, to lead Moses during the exodus from Egypt when the people return to Canaan, their native land. Number three, Volta, yes. The sacred commandments were the Hebrew law code similar to the Mesopotamian constitutions of the time. Number four, the code defined that the human being was created according to the image and likeness of God by the breath of eternal life, which confers human dignity with equal and inalienable rights, rights of freedom and autonomy to all human beings. Number five, the code obliges the practice of sabbatical rest for the whole community, free, slaves, migrants, and foreigners in three ways. Uh, the Shabbat day, when all communities should rest, having a rest day on earth. B, gap year, when the rest or when the rest of current if every seven every years. Seven. See, the double year with which occurs mm -hmm. every 49 years. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Six, the solidarity was unbelievable. It was a conscious normative procedure to achieve national objectives, promote debt forgiveness, undertake universal collective rest between beings in rational and rational. Support maintain the life of the fauna and flora, give the land a rest to maintain full productive capacity, develop the spirit of humanity, give freedom and autonomy to the oppressed, rebuild a dignified individual and collective life, and restore possessions, abolish all activities to eliminate slavery and land exploitation as well. Number seven, sabbatical rest was mandatory law, a process of teaching and learning a universal rest skill based on the spirit of solidarity to eliminate social inequalities uh, uh, yeah. necessary to materialize the recognition of the inherent dignity of human, each human creature and their equal and inalienable yeah. rights. Number eight, it's concluded that the Hebrew solidarity was a structural principle of the nation to materialize the dignity and autonomy of the human being. It's a historic reality that allows us to say that it was the forerunner of values enshrined after the Second World War. It's recognizing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that recognizes uh, the inherent dignity of the human being with equal and inalienable rights, like the foundations of freedom, just and justice yeah. and peace. Article number one. Okay. 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 Ok
Ah, oh, yes. Uh -huh. So, article number one. All human beings. Dentro da é, a comparação entre a declaração e o direito da em lá União Europeia. Article com a relação entre Europe, European Union Declaration. Ah, yes. Okay. Article number one. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Endowed with reason and conscience, they must act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Preâmbulo da declaração. Preâmbulo da declaração. Of the declaration of the human rights. So that man is not compelled in supreme recourse to revolt against tyranny and oppression. Article number three. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. In this period, it was still mandatory to practice remission, forgiveness, the, and the abolition of slavery and all oppressive practices. Article number yes, yes. 10. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the right and full quality to have his cause equitably, equitably mm -hmm. and public, publicly tried by an independent and impartial court that decides his rights and obligations or the reasons for any criminal charges against him uh, be deducted. Article number 15. Everyone has the right to a nationality. No one can be arbitrarily deprived of his nationality or the right to change nationality. Article number 18. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought uh, conscience and religion. This right implies the freedom to change religion, re religion or belief, as well as the freedom to manifest religion or belief alone or in common, both in public, both in public and in private, through teaching, practice, worship, and rights. <clears throat> Article number 25. Everyone has the right to a standard of living uh, sufficient to ensure that he and his family are healthy and well-being, particularly with regard to food, clothing, accommodation, medical assistance, and even the necessary social services, and the right to security in unemployment, illness, disability, with the hood, old age, or other cases of loss or livelihood due to circumstances beyond their control. Two, motherhood and childhood are entitled to special help and assistance. All children, whether born in or out of wedlock, uh, enjoy the same social protection. That's the end? That's the end. Uh -huh. Or is it the article? No. I think it's 25. No, no that's the end. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, that's the end of the article. Finish here. Terminou? Sim. Uh -huh. Agradecemos. Ok, well, thank you Eu very agrade... much. Então, She thanks you very much. Você está aqui, ó. Uh -huh. Eles estão aqui. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Tania. Th and thank you very much to your English professor also for helping us uh, through <laughs> this speech. Uh, uh, I, think, I, 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 think, I think you, Prof. Tim, uh, I, I don't speak English, no, no very well, entonces. And <laughs> but but you did a great job. Your slides were perfect, and so everybody <laughs> could understand uh, without no problem. And I thank you as well for uh, reminding us that uh, uh, often when we speak about human rights in general, social rights in particular, and solidarity even more in particular, uh, we uh, th they they are considered the human right almost. Uh, uh, more than like religion or something of the kind for many of us that the roots of this more than like religion can be found also in ancient pure religion as well as in your in your speech and in your writing so uh, let's let's go to the next speaker next speaker is alexander who is a LLM candidate at the School of Law at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam, and the title of his uh, speech will be Solidarity and Use of Language in Courts, who is entitled to speak. 
Um, so uh, I leave the floor to you, Alexander. Thank you very much. And please, uh, I remind you as well that you have to respect the 10 minutes uh, uh, time. Thank you, Professor Pasquale, uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation. Uh, indeed, I will talk about the connections uh, between solidarity and language use, more particularly the use of languages, different languages in, in courts and in, so in um, judicial proceedings. And um, what I will highlight is the, the different perception, I would say, um, between uh, the way uh, national states see uh, of a certain different from the uh, official language of the state and the um, European Court of Justice uh, perception on this topic and how in different cases this um, different perception clashed and how the um, European Court of Justice justified the um, extension of uh, the use of a certain language in judicial proceedings to um, citizens of other member states speaking the same language as a certain language group or minority within uh, another state. Um, this justification on, on the grounds of solidarity. So I think one important remark is to be made, and that is that we need to distinguish the right to use uh, um, minority language in a judicial proceeding from the more general, we just uh, heard uh, a presentation about, um, about fundamental rights. We have to distinguish them from the fundamental right to uh, having a fair trial. And so having a trial and language one understands, or in case uh, having the right uh, um, to be assisted by an interpreter. Because indeed, um, the difference is that um, the right to an interpreter um, is something everybody and not only a member of a certain community speaking a, a certain language. And also in this case, um, to be granted the right to an interpreter, one has to prove that he or she as a defendant is not able to speak the language the trial actually should take place in while usually with a uh, minority uh, language right protection, this uh, requisite doesn't apply, meaning that even though the official language is known by a defendant, given the minority language right, he's allowed to either a trial, a full trial in that language, or just to use that language um, and receive a translation of uh, important acts. So I will uh, now talk about um, these um, three cases I actually want to briefly analyze, um, which um, date back starting from 1985 until 2015, and where the European Court of Justice basically debunked three um, requisites member states um, had for the use of um, uh, minority language, namely the uh, requisite of um, citizenship, of residency, and at the end also of territoriality. So the, the trial was held in a specific area where this um, the protection of a certain minority language applied. So the first case I uh, want to talk about is Much, a case from 1985. So it's a pre-European citizenship case. And here a uh, um, defendant from Luxembourg uh, wanted to use the German language in, in, in Belgium, in a region where German was a minority language. So he wasn't granted that right on the basis that um, the law um, granting uh, the right to use the German language only envisaged Belgian uh, citizens. And well, Alexander, the, you have five minutes. Yeah. The, the European Court of Justice uh, disagreed on that, um, saying that um, pursuant Regulation 1612 of 68, uh, workers uh, have the same uh, social and tax advantages um, 
workers from another member state than citizens of the member state itself. Since the defendant was a worker uh, in Belgium, he was basically granted the same right and the extension um, followed on the basis of his working status. In a second case of 98, and this happened in, um, in Italy, in the autonomous province of Bolzano, um, an, an Austrian and a German um, citizens were defendant in a criminal trial and they were not workers, they were simply tourists. So the, the president uh, uh, of, of Murch didn't apply. So, um, and they were denied the right of using that language on the basis that they were uh, neither nationals nor residents in that area. Um, so this time the Court of Justice granted them the right on the basis of uh, the principle of uh, non-discrimination and doing this it extended not only to workers but to every citizen of the European Union um, without uh, any kind of requisites being either working status or, or residency. In a third case of 2013, um, this was further extended because it was unclear whether this would only entail people from states where the minority language in another state were the official language or to everybody who was simply able to speak that language. In 2013, this was clarified by the court, extending the use of a language that has minority language status in a certain um, in a certain state to every EU citizen who is able to speak that language. And in doing this, um, this extension uh, was basically complete, an extension that had always been denied by national states on the basis that the solidarity was limited to the members of that particular uh, language group within the uh, national state. So after this, a, an interesting twist actually happened because the Italian uh, state had always... Two minutes, Alexander. ...always denied this, uh, the possibility of the extension, actually did, uh, the did uh, an inversion. What, what was done was uh, that by law, the use to use uh, the, the possibility to use German uh, within the province of Bolzano was uh, extended to all citizens. So not only European citizens, but basically to, to all citizens. So we see that um, actually what started as uh, an extension of solidarity, taking it from the uh, national context to European context and therefore extending it from the um, uh, members of a minority to um, all European citizens and therefore making a right that was very, very um, peculiar, making it become, um, well, basically a valuable tool. Uh, all, all citizens uh, of, the, of the Union um, had access to um, influence national legislation and therefore opening up the, um, the, the right to use a minority language even beyond um, beyond uh, union borders and to to basically every every citizen um, that happens to be uh, a defendant and this could have an impact also in other states having uh, minority languages and um, which will have to allow um, also nationals from other states who speak that same minority language. Thank you for your attendance. That was uh, for your attention. That was my presentation. <laughs> thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, and I thank you for uh, um, talking uh, about languages, as some of you might know, is one of my passion. I have been writing a book about the problem of interpretation when there are different official languages. And the European Union also in this field is a peculiarity in the world because we have 24 official languages, which is huge, but with Brexit, we might have 23 and no English as an official language, in theory. I don't know how they will solve. I find it quite funny. Uh, 
I do agree, but uh, I would like to remind that languages are made to understand each other and to meet, not to divide in general. And these require many reflection because too many languages is brings some difficulties and some co some important costs with them. But okay, it's 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 that's that's another topic. We'll talk about it some other time maybe because now we have to keep. Uh, talking about uh, solidarity and so i will give the floor with pleasure to our next speaker who is annie butkuzi uh, she is a lawyer a senior specialist of the ministry of justice of georgia and uh, her topic will be social security in europe and georgia uh, welcome Annie, it's a, it's a pleasure to see you again after uh, all these months, uh, I hope everything is fine with you, and so yeah. I, I give you, I give you, I give you the, the floor immediately, you can, you can start speaking, please try to respect the 10 minutes. Okay, uh, hello. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Anne Butkhose uh, from Georgia and uh, uh, nice to meet you all again. Uh, I'm, and I'm now I'm uh, going to present my paper uh, uh, about uh, social security in uh, Europe and in Georgia. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, paper is not um, uh, exhaustive, uh, uh, but it's just uh, a brief review of some, um, uh, some important issues of social security. So uh, such um, uh, such as uh, uh, such as portability of rights, third country nationals, uh, and uh, also uh, social security uh, in uh, Georgia. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm I'm going to uh, to present the theme as shortly as uh, possible. Uh, so. In the modern world, social problematics are characterized with increasing relevance. Uh, social policy takes a place even more important. In more um, some member states of European Union, uh, the social sphere is the most important throughout the world. According to the governmental approaches uh, and welfare model based on social equality, uh, social equality. Uh, uh, now I'm uh, going uh, to uh, to pay our attention uh, to uh, social security themes in Georgia, uh, in, uh, in Georgia, uh, and uh, uh, just one moment. Uh, and uh, the preamble uh, of the uh, Constitution of Georgia affirmed uh, the uh, strong will of the citizens of Georgia in establishing a social state. Besides this, the Constitution of Georgia contains provisions uh, creating several social rights, such as right to, to education, right to live in a healthy environment, right to uh, receive free medical services, right to receives the uh, subsistence minimum um, and so on. Uh, even though it's a widely believed that Georgian constitution contains a very scarce list of social rights because there is uh, uh, not strengthened, for example, the right of housing uh, and the social security generally. Despite of a uh, scarce list of uh, uh, social rights and constitution, the Constitutional Court of Georgia uh, uh, delivered several important decisions in this field. We can mark out the decision in which Constitutional Court uh, indicated that government must ensure at least minimal level of social security. By the evaluation of the court, action of the government in this case must be stable, evolutionary in nature, and must be stand out by positive dynamics. Uh, this case was about uh, uh, old age uh, pension, uh, and um, uh, the uh, uh, decision like this was made by uh, the Constitutional Court uh, of Georgia. Uh, as um, uh, as um, uh, the social security system in Georgia, uh, it must be mentioned that in the last 25 years, social security systems in Georgia has consider considerably developed. Uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union caused the change of system of Soviet social policy. 
The existing system was destroyed and it was necessary to build a new one. The model of the social security of Soviet Union could no longer exist for two main reasons. There was no enough financial resources and there was no effectively working public services and legislation. So at the end of 1990s began the creation of the new legislation system of social security. But uh, it must be mentioned that uh, till 2003, uh, it was hard uh, to belong the existing system uh, to any uh, existing social system. Uh, but uh, the system which uh, exists today in Georgia uh, began in uh, 2006. Mm which is uh, too close to liberal Anglo-Saxon model. Social protection system in Georgia uh, consists basically of two components, uh, uh, which are uh, targeted social um, uh, protection and uh, the pension of age, which means that the state has no preventing, unfortunately has no preventing mechanism to avoid the citizens to be under uh, the poverty line. In fact, a huge number of the uh, uh, poorest part of citizens depends on social aid because they uh, don't have uh, other opportunity. Um, and um, also there in Georgia, there's a problem that uh, it's hard for the poorest people to integrate in society, to escape from the status and uh, to be successful, complete, complete member of society. Uh, however, uh, it must, must be noted that in uh, order to development of the uh, security system uh, and overcome poverty in Georgia has been uh, elaborated the development plan uh, for social security field in Georgia uh, for uh, 2030. And this uh, paper has um, uh, has uh, very strictly defined plans, uh, which uh, such as in, uh, such uh, as uh, increasing uh, the possibilities of employment, creation of an old age pension system for elderly pe people, and um, you know, this uh, kind of accumulate five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, and old age pension and uh, accumulating system uh, are, is already begun to exist. Uh, begun to exist. And it's one uh, big step uh, for our future uh, in a social security field. Uh, and um, uh, social security field. And, and also uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, development plan uh, strictly defines uh, the uh, strength and the community-based services and the role of social worker. Create a social security system orientated on children and strengthen the family of family social inclusion of pensions with, with disabilities uh, and uh, as a uh, as, uh, conclusion uh, as conclu in conclusion uh, we could um, uh, affirm that georgian social security system is not the example of perfection but a economy capital of the country, government is trying to improve the system year by year. And it should be noted that during the current difficult period caused by COVID-19, social uh, pensions continue to increase in Georgia. Um, it's uh, clear that Georgia will going to be part of the European Union uh, and as an associated country should share the European approaches in order to be closer or even similar to the European social system of the European mm, for mm, the fulfillment of the obligations based on association agreements. From my point of view, uh, towards the market goals, first of all, the government uh, should promote um, uh, strong state institutions and encourage the non-governmental sector to take active part during discussing issues about social security field. Uh, thank you for attention. That's uh, my presentation. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Annie, uh, for this interesting presentation. In such a short time, you were able to explain us as uh, uh, your country, Georgia, uh, recovered and was able to build a social security system after a earthquake as the Soviet Union implosion has, uh, has been for all the countries that were inside that system. And uh, But Georgia was able to... to to um, take this challenge and develop uh, his own, its own social security system. Uh, so I will give the floor to next speaker, who is Shinaide Mafra Olanda Maya. She's a lawyer at the Shinaide Mafra Law Firm in Brazil, and the title of her speech will be The Antagonism Between the Right to Exist and the new social security, greater affectation for women. So uh, the floor is your, uh, Schneide. Please respect the 10 minutes time. I think you have your microphone switched off, Schneide. Okay, maybe she has some connection problems. Let's see if she is able to solve them quickly. Let's wait one or two minutes, uh, uh, then we'll give the word to the next speaker eventually. So I'm very happy to see you all uh, here again after all these months. Unfortunately, it's only through uh, the computer and not in person. I hope that we will have uh, an occasion uh, to meet uh, again uh, soon, maybe next the further initiatives uh, of uh, the uh, Jean Monnet module. That, that, that's what I really hope. Uh, okay, uh, while Shinaide is trying to solve her problem, I would give uh, the floor to Miriam Schettini. Uh, she's a PhD student at uh, our university. Actually, I am the director of her thesis. And um, okay, in this occasion, I want to thank you uh, officially and, pu and publicly. Ah, okay, maybe Shinaida is back. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. I, I will be what is starting. Thank you very much, Naide. First of all, let me thank you for coming here today. Let me introduce myself. I'm Schneid Mafra. I'm a professor of social security and a lawyer. And I would like today about the antagonism between the right to exist and the new social security, greater affection of a woman. Well, in February is this year, I had the opportunity to participate in a lecture with Teresa Russo, and I noticed that current concerns in Europe are totally different here in Brazil. While progressive thinking in you is about increasing quality, it opposes our reform. However, in Brazil, we had a great social setback. Since the previous government, there is an idea about a pension of reform. However, only the Bolsonaro government did actually happen. The government placed it as a main pillar of economic growth and aimed to save 1 trillion to 10 years. Therefore, increasing the minimum age of human from 60, 60 to 62 years old. Extinction of retirement due to contribution time, restriction to pension benefit to death, as well restriction to accumulation of retirement with pension besides having made 
the Institute of Special Retirement, almost unattainable benefit. So you know, né? you better know this origin in social security, the born in the family in passing the church and the second moment in industrial revolution. That is the fact. A great concern with social protection is Bismarck in 1884. Was the first legislation on accidents at work in 1935 is a head social security in the United States and in 1940 in 1935 it had the social security in England, the beverage plan. From the beverage Bismarck systems, you have the historic assumptions that allowed the full theoretical formation of the welfare states. Only in Brazil, so only in 1980, the constitution did social rights become effective. However, the state of the social welfare states don't have it implemented here, has in a rope. And statistical duds about the antagonism in Brazil, these studies released by the IBGE shows the poverty in Brazil increased between 2016 and 27, according to data from the synthesis of social indicators. Furthermore, according to data in 2018, World Economic Forum is Brazil is 95 position in the global index among the 149 countries evaluated in the political and economic participation of women. Their rate of economic participation in the opportunities for women is 64%. It is estimated that at a rate of 28, Brazil will take 202 years to achieve economic equality between women and men. Is very impressive. <laughs> The participation rate of men in the labor market was 71.5% and for women is 52.7%. Women are in the less social value occupation that men concentrate in the areas of education, health and social services commerce and repair and domestic service. It's, it is important to note that quality between men and women is worldwide. However, the Nordic countries are those that occup the top positions of the ranking in with great parity among the, tw the 20 largest economies in the world. France leads the list in the 12th place, followed by German, the United Kingdom, Canada, and South Africa. So, we'll finally, the elements revolve the astute revolution of social security from its origins to the contemporary and the proposal for the futures showing how deep are the changes promoted by constitutional amendment 103 that impact on the lives of the Brazilian women. Considering the statistical dates and the changes proposed by, by constitutional amendment 103, it's a clear that access of the women to social security benefits will be impaired due to increasing the minimum age from 60 from 62 years, raising the contribution time for retirement from 
30 years for 35 years. In addition to decreasing the pension amount due to death and impossibility of fully accumulation pension and retirement benefits. She had a year five minutes. Yes. I respect the time. <laughs> there was no development of a solution. Thank you. For, <laughs> thank you. For maintaining women in the labor making. No policies of equal pay, unlike with what happened in the European countries, which developed the parallel devices to promote employment. One year after, we are facing some troubles with the constitutional amendment. We have already seen that many women are finding some difficulties in the pandemic time because they are receiving less and facing some troubles to the get around retirement. As a final point, it's observed that the social character intrinsic to social security, it was abandoned by the government that made a purely economic reading offend the right to a dignified existence of the individual and the harm the oil Brazilian society. Since the harmful consequences of today's changes will be perpetuated in the oil society for years to come in the oil society when there will be a legion of poor people of the decline of social protection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shinaide, for respecting the time and also and mainly for giving us such an interesting lecture uh, on another of the big problem that social security and solidarity must tackle, which is the problem of the female condition, which not only in Brazil, but in general around the world is not at the level where, 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 where it should be. Uh, so I give the floor to the next speaker, who is uh, Miriam Schettini. She is also a PhD student at the Department of Law here at the University of Pisa. Actually, I am her thesis director, and I would like in this occasion to thank you officially and publicly, Miriam and Gabriele, for their effort in uh, helping me and uh, Professor Matteo del Chica in uh, organizing the winter school and all the activities related. The title of the uh, presentation of Miriam uh, will be the draft declaration on the right to international solidarity. Uh, until now, we have been uh, speaking about solidarity in the European Union, in other parts of the world, uh, in particular Brazil and Georgia. And now let's see if there is something or not on the global level, on the universal level. Uh, the floor is to you, Miriam. So, good afternoon to all. Thank you so much, Professor Pasquale, for your presentation and for your kind words. So uh, I'm going to talk about something that in part uh, uh, encompasses the analysis made so far. Uh, however, there is a substantial difference that can be seen just by looking at the title of my presentation. Uh, until now, uh, the discussion focused on the principle of solidarity and its different application to law, but not uh, on a right solidarity. So, uh, first of all, what kind of right is it? Uh, it falls into the category of human rights. Uh, but uh, in international human rights law, solidarity has two different uses. Uh, the first one uh, refers to solidarity rights as a category of human rights. Uh, in the 70s, Paul Vazak, uh, proposed the, the division of human rights into three categories, uh, or better, into three generations. So first generation human rights are rights that are civil and political in nature, and they imply negative obligations for states. 
Uh, second generation human rights are economic, social and cultural rights and they presume positive action of the state. Third generation human rights, finally, that are also solidarity rights, are human rights that are new. Uh, Examples of solidarity rights are um, the right to economic and social development, uh, the right to participate and benefit from the common heritage of mankind, the, the right to peace and so on and so forth. So this kind of rights have the human being at their center indeed, but they have also a collective direction requiring the concerted effort of the whole international community in order to be realized. So they do not concern the sole relationship between the state and the individual. Uh, this right, uh, however, are still very vague in content and the concept of solidarity rights still arouses controversy. Uh, however, I don't want to focus on this kind of right. Um, as I told you at the beginning, solidarity uh, within the framework of international human rights as two different uses. The second use on which I would like to focus my attention is the right of solidarity. Uh, now, the right of solidarity should not be confused with the category of solidarity rights that I just mentioned, because the right of solidarity is a separate right that falls into the category of solidarity rights. Uh, what is the content of this right? Uh, in 2005, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, now Human Rights Council, create the mandate for an independent expert on human rights and international solidarity. Um, I don't have enough time to explain in detail uh, the work of the three independent experts who dealt with this topic, uh, but I would like to focus on the most important outcome of the work carried out under this mandate. That is the draft declaration on the right to international solidarity. Uh, this draft declaration has been presented in 2007 by the second independent expert, Virginia Dandana. And I think it is important to stress that such declaration is still only a draft. It has not yet been submitted to the General Assembly for approval and has not a binding effect. So in the draft declaration, we find at Article 4, uh, a definition of the right of solidarity that I mentioned, that is um, a right, a human right, by which individuals and peoples are entitled on the basis of equality and non-discrimination to participate, contribute and enjoy a social and international order in which all human rights and fundamental freedoms can be fully realized. So we have seen the content of these rights. Now, who are the right holders of the right of solidarity? They are individuals and peoples, regardless of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinions, so any kind of difference. They have the right individually and in association with others within and beyond their territories and national boundaries to claim the right to international solidarity, with particular reference to indigenous peoples, minorities, migrants, refugees, and other groups. So we see that the right holders are both individuals and peoples. Thus, it is an individual right and a collective right at the same time. We see that, that this right has a national dimension, but also an Miriam, international five dimension. Minutes. Okay, and even a transnational dimension. We see that is a right that refers to everyone without discrimination, but it is particularly concerned about the weaker categories. So we have seen the content of the right of solidarity, the right holders of the right of solidarity. Now, who are? the duty bearers of this right. They are, according to Article 6 of the Dart Declaration, all states, whether acting individually or collectively, 
including through international or regional organization of which they are members. So states have the primary duty to realize the right to international solidarity. But the declaration goes even beyond this because following the evolution of the international community, it is stated that also international organizations and non-state actors have a duty to respect the right to international solidarity, in particular when such actors bear similar or complementary responsibilities to the duties of states. So from all of this, it emerged that the right of solidarity and the principle of solid solidarity are strongly interconnected because only if the principle of solidarity is fully realized at every level, it is possible to have an international order in which the right of, solid of solidarity can be granted to all. In fact, uh, international solidarity implies common responsibilities and also interest among individuals, national groups, states, international organizations. The solidarity in a certain way encompasses the union of interest, purposes, action, and implies at the same time the recognition of uh, different needs and rights in order to achieve common goals which require international cooperation and joint action. In fact, in the declaration, it is also stated that solidarity is a principle that underpins contemporary international law in order to preserve the international order and to ensure the survival of international society. So for sure, the translation of such principle of solidarity Miriam, in all two its complexities, yes, I, I finished, into a claimable rights for all is not an easy task. The challenges for the adoption of the declaration are many and the recognition of the right of solidarity is difficult. However, perhaps the right of solidarity could be a fundamental tool to tackle global problems arising from an increasingly interlinked and uh, interdependent international society where more than cooperation is needed, like the COVID pandemic has unfortunately demonstrated. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Miriam, for trying bravely to understand if a true right to solidarity exists or not in international law, not, not an easy task, not at all. And uh, let's go to the next and last speaker before the conclusions. And is also is Gabriele Rugani, is also a PhD student at our university, at the Department of Law at the University of Pisa and his uh, speech will be about solidarity in Africa, in African sub-regional organization, the case of ECOWAS. The floor to you, Gabriele. Thank you very much, Professor, for this opportunity and for your words. Uh, I'll share my screen. Uh, I think that now you are able to see it. Uh, so, the topic of my presentation is Solidarity in African Sub-Regional Organizations, the case of ECOWAS. Uh, what is ECOWAS? Uh, ECOWAS is the economic community of West African states. It is a sub-regional African organization, as I said before, and it was established in 1975. It includes uh, 15 countries uh, which are located, as you can see, in the western part of the African continent. But first of all, why ECOWAS? Uh, why did I choose ECOWAS and not another uh, uh, regional or sub-regional African organization or a, a regional organization of another area of the world? Why? Uh, because there are relevant similarities between ECOWAS treaty and EU treaties. Let's see some of those similarities. It is enough to read the list of ECOWAS institutions because we can see the authority of heads of state and government, the Council of Ministers, the ECOWAS Parliament, the Commission, the Community Court of Justice, the Economic and Social Council, 
And also with regard to ECOWAS sources of secondary law, we can find uh, the same regulations, directive, directives, and also recommendations. So uh, there are big similarities with uh, EU institutions and EU sources of secondary law. Is this uh, a casualty, uh, a coincidence? It is not. ECOWAS modeled its integration strategy along the lines of the European communities and then of the European Union. So there is a specific attempt to imitate the uh, European integration process. So the question is, uh, we saw that there are uh, there is a certain degree of uh, solidarity in uh, EU law. Uh, is there a certain degree of solidarity also in ECOWAS law? Do those similarities between the two organizations also concern the principle of solidarity? Well, to answer this question, it is extremely important to go back to 1993. Uh, there was a very, very important revision of ECOWAS treaty. Before 1993, we have to remember that ECOWAS was extremely inactive. And this moment was an important step towards uh, uh, what can be called, scholars call the social solidary dimension of West African integration. Uh, indeed, it was at a entirely new chapter, chapter 11, which is specifically devoted to cooperation in human resources, information, social and cultural affairs, articles from 60 to 66. I'll mention two of those, article 60, human resources, which talks about the strengthening of cooperation in the fields of education, training and employment, and also article 61, social affairs, which talks about the harmonization of labor laws, social security legislation, and also the strengthening of the cooperation in health matters. So this is the framework. This is the social and solidary dimension of West African integration. We are moving in this uh, uh, framework. And uh, um, considering that this is the framework, I would like to make two examples. Uh, uh, of course, it's not uh, exhaustive, as I just said, I'm talking about the two examples, but in my opinion, they are particularly relevant. Uh, the first example is ECOVAS General Convention on Security. The second one is the ECOVAS response to the Ebola epidemic. Why did I choose those two examples? First of all, because we are talking about different forms of solidarity. Uh, one is a solidarity between member states and non-nationals. The other one is a, an example of solidarity among states. Uh, moreover, these two examples allow easy comparisons with uh, EU law. Uh, starting from ECOWAS General, ECOWAS General Convention on Social Security. Uh, this convention was drafted in 1993, adopted in 2013, and it is extremely important because, uh, as I wrote on the slide, it ensures that individuals residing in a given ECOWAS country have the same rights and obligations under the social security laws as do national of that same country. So portability among the ECOWAS states of social security rights. And the convention applies to um, some branches of social security such as disability benefits, old age benefits, survivors benefits, occupational and work-related accidents, family benefits, maternity benefits, health care and sickness benefits, unemployment benefits. It is an extremely important instrument and uh, of course we can make some comparisons with EU law, in particular with instruments such as Directive 2004-38, which uh, deals also with social rights of migrant union citizens. So we can yeah, see... Yeah, yeah, five minutes. Thank you very much, Professor. So we can see some similarities and a certain degree of solidarity. The second example is the ECOWAS response to Ebola epidemic. And of course, in this case, the comparison is very easy with the EU response to COVID-19 pandemic. ECOWAS has the mandate because 61, which I mentioned before, which talk, talks about health matters, strengthening cooperation in health matters. Moreover, we have to remember that in 1987, ECOWAS member states had established the West African Health Organization. And um, there were uh, uh, various actions, various measures, both in the early response stage, 
where some uh, sums of money were used in order to strengthen the epidemiological uh, the surveillance and capacity of the member states, not only of the affected states, but also non-affected countries. This in the, in the early response stage. And also in the emergency response stage, we have some important measures, such as the establishment of solidarity fund. Uh, and Nigeria, which is the biggest country of the, the region, uh, contributed with, uh, with uh, 3.5 million US dollars. And moreover, uh, uh, ECOWAS health ministers decided to uh, deploy health personnel, 150 trained volunteers. So these are some measures. Uh, we can see from these two examples that there are some, uh, um, some similarities, of course, uh, and we could exist in theory a certain degree of solidarity. But um, simply identifying the legal measures which are adopted by a region is an insufficient indication of the success of regional social and solidary policies, as I wrote on the slide. There is a, a big problem that uh, there are some factors, some elements that uh, uh, didn't allow the success of the mentioned policies. And in particular, uh, there are factors such as the infrastructure deficit of the member states, but also the inefficiency and corruption of national institutions. And some such problem is extremely connected with the, the lack of rule of law. It means that the institutions uh, do not obey the law. And it's a, it's, it's a terrible problem, of course. And often uh, there is also a lack of political will of member states to implement ECOWAS policies. And these reasons uh, led to the failure yes. of many ECOWAS. Thank you very much, Professor the failure of many ECOWAS initiatives, and also the two initiatives we mentioned today. In particular, with regard to the ECOWAS General Convention on Social Security, the state of implementation of, of such convention is extremely scarce, inefficient, inadequate. Um, the factors are unequal development of national social security systems. So, of course, this, me this means that some services cannot be offered in some states if compared to other states. And moreover, there is also an insufficient administrative capacity. And also with regard to ECOWAS initiatives in response to the Ebola epidemic, we can say the same thing. ECOWAS tried to act, but it relied too much on weak and inadequate national institutions, especially health institutions and efficient and um, corrupted, didn't have uh, enough personnel. So, in conclusion, what can we say? We can say that, in theory, we can find a certain degree of solidarity in, in ECOWAS because there are some instruments, some provisions, uh, and there are also some similarities with the EU. The problem is that solidarity remains in the books. Uh, as opposed to what happens in Europe, because in Europe there are the factors that allow uh, a de facto solidarity, at least in some occasions. In West Africa, there are still relevant factors, infrastructures, institutions, political dynamics, which unfortunately hinder the implementation of social and solidary policies. That's it. That's the end of my presentation. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabriele. Uh, you explained to us very clearly um, what is the situation of solidarity in another uh, regional or sub-regional, in this case, organization, and you compared it with the European Union, and uh, correctly you explained that the similarities between ECOWAS and EU are on paper more than on practice. for the reason that 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 you told us uh, so uh, that's almost the end because we ended all the uh, keynote speeches but first of all uh, i apologize with matteo del chica he was due to give us the introductory remarks but i simply forgot so i asked him to uh, give us uh, uh, 
uh, not any more introductory remarks, but some remarks now before the conclusion that will be made by uh, Professor Marcello Labanca. So um, the floor to you, Matteo, and also for you in this occasion, I want to thank you publicly and officially for all the job that you have been doing and you are still doing inside the Geamone module in general and in particular uh, with the um, with the winter school activities. Thank you, Professor Pasquale. No issues uh, for, for first. Uh, let me please thank him once again on behalf of all the participants, because without his careful leadership, nothing of all this could be possible. Coming to just some brief remarks, I would like to remind that the book presented today and this workshop as well collect several working papers which have been developed inside the Jamonet module Solidarity in EU Law. These papers resulted from debates on solidarity that were discussed and implemented by some participants during the Jamonet module activities, mainly through workshops, roundtables, and the winter school as well. It should be highlighted that the focus of this collected book is obviously the European Union law perspective, but it is not limited to it only. Also the papers presented today, of course, most of them are grounded on the corresponding chapters of the book, face solidarity issues through multiple perspectives. How such multiple perspective could be linked? Well, you should read the book to discover it, even if Professor Pasquale gave us many valuable hints during this workshop today. The debates on solidarity in the Germanic module obviously will go on after this workshop. This is only a step in our path, but the papers presented today and the conclusions of Professor Marcelo Labanca, who honors us with his presence, will give a great help to the interesting and useful discussion about solidarity in EU law and beyond. Thanking once again Professor Pasquale and all the participants as well, and I give back the floor to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, so let's conclude with uh, Professor Marcelo Labanca, who, as correctly Matteo Del Chica told, honors us of his presence, uh, and he will conclude uh, the works of today's workshop. The floor to you, Marcelo. So, uh, well, just a minute, please. Now, here. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Leo. Thank you very much for this invitation and being here with you all. Uh, in January, we were together at PISA and in this, uh, this course, this uh, winter school about solidarity. And I'm very glad and happy that uh, from that course, we can be here all again and together and and launch, launching this this book that's going to be i think a uh, very a very important book to to those that uh, research principle of solidarity not only in europe but also uh, abroad in latin america and brazil and uh, well i was thinking about those uh, these presentations and also reading the book and i have some questions that there are more doubts of mine, and I would I would like to share with all all of you here about my my questions about principle of solidarity because I don't know Leo I think you 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 know that I I am a researcher I'm a Brazilian researcher and I am a, a Brazilian a professor of constitutional law, but it seems to me that uh, constitutional law and professors of con constitutional law and also international law they are coming together in in same issues and uh, that has to do with protection of rights and uh, actually protection of human rights and uh, in a multi-level system uh, uh, today uh, by the way we are in the international uh, human rights day in, in december 10 and uh, we 
think about how we can uh, give uh, more protection uh, of rights in this multi-level le level system. So thinking about this and also thinking about a uh, principle of solidarity, I thought that uh, actually the the it's it's not a matter only of solidarity. It's not a, a value idea, but uh, 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 it's it's like it's enforced in rules and in 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 the in the origins of of uh, European Union. You know, in the fifties uh, there was uh, in fifties there was uh, 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 the word solidarity. And also uh, in the Treaty of Euro European Union, uh, as a value, as a principle, or uh, as an objective uh, to be to be executed by, by by the states. But I think I think it's it's not only a matter of of solidarity, but how 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 can uh, the principle of solidarity uh, be reverted to a protection of rights? Is, is that what you're talking about? Because if you see the presentations and the, the, the book, how 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 was written, you see uh, all all those subjects, all those issues here, uh, Ana Milioni, Andrea uh, Ferraso, uh, Alessio, Geraldo Magella, all of them, they talk about uh, protection of rights or human rights uh, be uh, in in this in this matter of social inequality or to vote for foreign residents, you know, and uh, those those remarks about social security uh, in Georgia and the solidarity and the, the, this question that that was taken by by Alexander, this question of language and uh, and language in courts. And we can we can think about the the protection of language uh, of minor minorities uh, uh, populations or, or people like like indigenous here in Brazil. So this has to do all uh, all the solidarity has to do with protection of rights. And in my researches here in Brazil, I focused this question about protection of rights and competencies and competencies act. Uh, in fact. More about federalism and how we can balance, balance unity and, and diversity, and how how we can uh, get a, a higher protection of rights, uh, including if it's in a lower level, not only by federal government, but by but by by state governments. So uh, talking about principle of solidarity is, is like dealing with the performance uh, of states and of countries. And uh, and what wh which actions they 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 are doing? They are uh, not only actions, but uh, also which which uh, how we can we can deny some omissive actions, you know. And uh, I think that it always has to do with competencies, with competencies. So uh, let me let me uh, take like five minutes uh, of your time to to explain something that it's in the in the origins in the beginnings of of how uh, rights can be protected it's about uh, who can do or which state can do what here in brazil i like i make a, a research i do research about uh if if the the guy that lives here in like here here in pernambuco i'm here in the in recife it's a uh, a city state, a uh, uh, capital state of the, the, the state of Pernambuco. But uh, do I really have the same rights uh, of uh, uh, another professor that is in, in Rio de Janeiro, for an example, or in Sao Paulo? Uh, what kind or what sort of rights they have and I don't have? And, uh, and why? why? And why they are more protected or menos or less protected than me? In my rights. So, uh, in the in the beginning, we when we when we when we study about competencies and share, uh, sorry, and and uh, competencies and uh, distribution of uh, repet repetition and distribution of competencies, we see that we had we had a, like a, a a kind of dual system where states had some competencies and the federal government and others. 
So there was an, a, no shared competencies about protecting rights, for an example. And uh, after that, we had uh, uh, another degree, we had another step that was like a, a shared competencies with the cooperation. So uh, they call uh, federalism or a cooperative federalism. When we, you're gonna you're gonna see some some kind of uh, concurrency competencies uh, th that you have also in Italy uh, after the the constitutional reform of of 2001. And uh, when you see that there is cooperation, but I think I think maybe we we could be in the third step. Of protection of rights, if we can uh, have, if we can have a view about uh, right protections, not only about cooperation, but but about solidarity. So maybe because uh, let's think about it. Solidarity. solidarity. There are plenty of meanings about solidarity uh, from, but solidarity is not, is not an act uh, an. Uh, is not an idea, only an idea. Solidarity is uh, it's it's a, a kind of rulemaking about uh, you know you have this in rules, and if you have this in rules in in laws and also in constitutions and international treaties, so you can, as a judge of an international court or a national court, you can analyze cases or case law about when states does or, or when states are doing something or are not doing something. So we can deny some actions, can determine that the states has to do something about that, about that, that problem. And uh, let, me, let me put here an example that was stated by uh, the Brazilian Supreme Court in, the, in, in these days about uh, cutting, I, I don't know how to say it well, but it's like about cutting electricity bill uh, when, sorry, when you don't pay, when you don't pay the bill of your, the electricity of your house and uh, it comes the company, electric company and cuts your, your so you, you can be able to have a refrigerator in your, in your, in your kitchen because you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, electricity and uh, you know this 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 argument is uh, who can make rules about this 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 argument about electricity in brazil it's, it's only the federal government that can rule can make uh, like a, a, it's it's the lawmaker about about this subject but here in brazil we had a a, a state law about uh, uh, denying or establishing statement that Nobody in the pandemic, in the period of pandemic, could have uh, could could be without electricity, either if if, if wasn't paying the bill, you know. And so the the federal Supreme Court said, well, this is a federal competency to rule about this, but because of the principle of solidarity, we can't uh, we can't allow people, the poorest people, Brazilian people, being without electricity, you know? So this, this, uh, this was very interesting because uh, they, they argue from the principle of solidarity to put the lines, or the, the broadest of, of the competencies about protecting rights. So when I see this workshop and these presentations, all those presentations here that, that was held here at, at Pisa, the city of Pisa, uh, I preferred being in, in person to Pisa, but uh, maybe next year. <laughs> but when we, 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 we hold this, 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 this yes, conference here, yeah, when we, if the pandemic allows them, when we hold this conference and we see so many uh, good researchers and and scholars writing about solidarity, they are, they are writing about rights protect protection. But the, the, the main point is, what is, or how can we translate solidarity to, to get a, a higher protection of, of human rights? This is the, the, the fundamental point. And how, how can we do this about uh, 
uh, like controlling the the, 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 the fundamentals of the, the, the decision making by the courts. And uh, in conclusion, how can we we balance uh, or how can we use the principles of solidarity about uh, giving more competencies or establishing that states can't not do something or can do something if in that way it's against the solidarity, you know? So who is the competency? You have those all those ships arriving from, from Africa and Europe and everybody says, no, it's not my responsibility. Well, it's, 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 it's a matter of responsibility. And if you think about solidarity, a principle of solidarity that is in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. So you can't not allow that some states, uh, some action, we, we are talking about controlling uh, state actions or uh, determining or uh, being, being assertive about what states, member states uh, of Europe, for example, or member states in, in a federation, what they can do or, or, or don't can, or, or, sorry, what they can or what they can't do. So I think we can use the, the, this principle. So we don't have an answer. I think we don't, we don't have an answer. Well, the answer is, it's not like, 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 like Dylan, Dylan one day said in the music, the, uh, the, the answer is not blowing in the wind. We have to, we have to, to, to study and we have to, to give in, uh, from, from law, from law approach, we have to give uh, uh, an adequate response about, about state actions uh, from or from the principle of solidarity. So uh, this is my, my, my argument. I, I would like to, to once again, thank you, uh, Leonardo. It's, uh, you are a great researcher and it's very important for us here in Brazil to have you like a partnership and University of Pisa here in our university. And I think this uh, with this subject, it's you. You you were very lucky at uh, choosing this argument to do this because that is what we need in our days. In our days, all we need is is to it's it's an adequate response about solidarity in in our days when we have an increase of populism and increase of uh, nationalism and all. A, a sort of of matters that comes against a, a, a feeling of of solidarity. So, thank you once again. And I I can well I'm gonna write here my mail if if anybody wants to 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 well to to share uh, some some. There you are. And well, thank you very much for you all. Thank you very much, Marcelo. And thank you very much for ending this workshop with such an interesting and stimulating perspective. Solidarity as a mean of protecting human rights. Very, very interesting. And I also appreciated uh, uh, your idea that the problem is to conjugate uh, unity and diversity as uh, you all know that's exactly the motto of the European Union is united in diversity so uh, you are we are exactly on the same uh, line as usual so thank you very much everybody I really uh, I am very glad that uh, to have seen you all after all these difficult months. I am happy that uh, you are everybody is fine, and I hope to see you again in Pisa in person as soon uh, as possible in Pisa or somewhere else as soon uh, as possible. So now uh, in this same uh, virtual room there will be another initiative which is a round table starting at uh, 17 at 5 p.m. 
COVID-19 and solidarity beyond law. And there will be speeches from representatives of the civil society, not just professors or scholars or students right now. So if some of you want to uh, stay here listening, you are all very welcome, of course. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, see you as soon as possible, as I hope. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, all.